All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. It is uh, what uh, December twenty third, twenty twenty. It's afternoon time here in the Pacific Northwest, Southern Oregon. Um, um, it's kind of cold outside, and uh, we're moving towards what to Christmas Eve and Christmas um, in the West here, anyways, and then moving towards the Nativity Feast in the East for those that are following the Julian calendar. I always try not to be ignorant of that. Although I am here, I tend to celebrate um, Christmas um, and make my own um, meanings and rituals and what's not for my children around the traditional time, um, just so they can partake of the Christmas um, magic and whatnot. And <clears throat> anyways, um, what I wanted to talk to you about was this water-damaged volume here that did come from my old library and somehow made it through the battle. Um, many of you may know from my previous videos about a lot of books that I had lost, and I'm trusting and knowing God will replace those volumes as necessary with even better things. Um, and the ones that I really needed stayed. It's too bad this was water damaged, but uh, it's called The Arena by this guy here, Ignatius Brian Chanov, Chanov, um, 1807 to 1867. Bishop Ignatius was prominent Orthodox spiritual writer of the 19th century Russia. Born in a noble family, he completed an education in engineering in St. Petersburg under the patronage of Emperor Nicholas I, and was destined for a brilliant worldly career. <clears throat> Later, as an officer, he chose instead to follow the spiritual yearning of his soul and receive monastic tonsure. As a disciple of the famous elder Lev of Optina Hermitage, well grounded in the ascetic writings of the Holy Fathers, Bishop Ignatius captured the spirit of the ancient patristic and monastic traditions of the Orthodox Church in his own works written in most eloquent language of the time. The present volume, The Arena, an offering of contemporary monasticism, which comprises of the fifth volume of his ascetical works, is an indispensable treasure for seekers of spiritual life today. <clears throat> picture it looks like of the Roman Colosseum there and here is the publisher there in Jordanville here's a Jordanville <laughs> prayer book and so, let's see here. Here's the introduction to the English edition. What do we want to look at? Yeah, it's such a bummer that these pages are water damaged, but they're not unreadable. I'm sure much of this is available online. Um, however, I'm thrilled to still have this out of everything that it has been through, that I had been through, um, that I can still drink from this fountain of knowledge and wisdom and spirituality here. Introduction to the English edition. The work that follows first appeared almost exactly a century ago, published at the St. Petersburg in the year 1867. It was originally named An Offering to Contemporary Monasticism, a beautiful title which aptly describes the character of the contents. This book is Bishop Ignatius Brynechenov's Offering to His Beloved Brethren, as he so often calls them in the course of its pages, his contribution to the monastic life of his day, and at the same time it is an offering of his whole life's work to Christ. Writing at the end of his time on earth, he died in the same year that the book appeared. He sought to embody in a single volume the fruit of some 40 years' experience in the monastic life, more than half of them spent as a superior of an important community on the borders of the Russian capital as a traveler who has endured terrible hardships on a long and difficult journey. The use of Bishop Ignatius' own words he offers to those who are undertaking the same journey his own notes on the path which he has followed. Bishop Ignatius 
compose his offering at the moment of the notable revival in monastic life of the Russian Orthodox Church. The religious communities of the 19th century Russia were distinguished by a number of remarkable figures. Saint Serov, directors and writers, men such as Saint Seraphim of Serov, the Starets, Leonid Markarius, and Ambrose of the Aptina Hermitage, Bishop Theophon the Recluse, and not least Bishop Ignatius Branichinov himself. Like other leaders of the Russian monastic revival, Ignatius was deeply rooted in the aesthetic and mystical doctrine of the Greek fathers, yet there was nothing antiquarian or academic about his devotion to teaching and the past. For this ancient tradition was something that he had experienced directly as a creative and dynamic reality of his personal life. In the present work, his mystical confession and spiritual legacy, as he terms in his foreword, he attempts to present a balanced synthesis of all that he sees. Forward for the meaning of this and other technical terms used in the Orthodox Church, see the glossary at the end of the book. For the tradition, something he had experienced directly and creative as a dynamic reality in his life, the present work, his mystical confession, and spiritual legacy. Let's see here. <clears throat> to be most important in the writings of the fathers concerning the monastic life, adopting what they say to the particular needs and conditions of his own day. As such, it is a book which will be of great value to anyone who wishes to understand Orthodox Orthodox monasticism in general, and in particular the Russian monastic revival of the 19th century. But Anexius's offering is very far from being a work exclusively for monks. As the author himself says, we hope that even lay people <clears throat> may also find our book helpful. As a brief glance at this table of contents will show, most of the chapters discuss matters of universal concern. Ignatius speaks of the place of the Bible in our inner life, the need for spiritual direction, and the relationship between the director or, or starrets and his disciple. The meaning of the prayer and the practice of the Jesus prayer, the role of suffering, the nature of temptation, and our warfare against demonic forces. And these are themes of vital interest not only to monks, but also to those living in the world. Nor is it surprising that a book originally written with monks in view should apply equally to other Christians. For monks and lay people are both following the same narrow way and are engaged in the same ascetic battle. True Christianity and true monasticism, writes Ignatius, consist in the practice of the commandments of the gospel. The definition of Christian and of monk is thus one and the same. Monasticism, he writes, is simply the duty fulfilling the exactitude of the commandments of the gospel. The monastic life is simply a life lived in accordance with the commandments of the gospel, but obviously the same evangelical rules that the monk seeks to carry out are also binding upon the members of the church. Ignatius is offering... A, uh, to contemporary monasticism is therefore at the same time an offering to every Christian. In view of this widely ranging scope of this book, the translator of the English version has chosen another title to indicate its more general character, the arena. In, it is a title which recalls the last hours of the Christian martyrs who met their death in such places as the Colosseum of Rome, men such as Ignatius, his own namesake, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who prayed that he might be the wheat for the teeth of wild beasts and whose prayer was answered. For later Christians living in more peaceful times, there has usually been no such outward visible arena, but they too are called to fight spiritually in the arena against wild beasts. As St. Clement of Rome expresses it, we are all in the same arena, involved in the same struggle. St. Paul talks of having fought with beasts in Ephesus, 1 Corinthians 15.32, and while he may mean a literal fight against animals in an outward arena, or a fight against bestial human beings, Acts 19, his words have also symbolical meaning. The real struggle is always an inner one. The arena where the struggle with the wild beast takes place is the unseen realm of interior life. Such then is Bishop Ignatius' basic theme. He tells us of the struggle to be undertaken by every Christian in the spiritual arena. He speaks to us all, whether monks or not, explaining how we may tame, control, and transform the beasts within, the lions, and the howling wolves of our inner jungle, and so build in our hearts Jerusalem, the city of peace and unity. Bishop Ignatius, Ignatius is one of the most 
able and attractive personalities of the Russian church of his time. By family background, Dmitry Alexandrovich Branichinov was, as he was at first known, was a member of the aristocracy, the son of a wealthy provincial landowner. In the Russian society of his time, it was distinctly unusual for a young man or woman of no, noble birth to enter a monastery. Dmitri's father was, in fact, envisaged to such a future for his son, but he intended him to follow the way in the life of normal one of his class. Born in 1807 and due to course, Dmitri was sent to the pioneer military school in St. Petersburg. Here he made excellent progress, winning the praise of his teachers, and during the inspection, he was especially noticed by Grand Duke Nicholas Pavlovich, the future Emperor Nicholas I. But Dmitri's heart was not in his military studies. From an early age, he had felt a vivid and insistent call towards an entirely different path, that of a monk. In later life, he recounted how during the time at the Pioneer School, he used to walk by himself in deep depression with the tears in his eyes because it seemed that there was no course open to him except a worldly career and an army officer. Even at the Pioneer School, however, he found time to practice inner prayer, and amongst his fellow pupils he discovered others with the same spiritual longings. They used to meet at night to pray together and to discuss religious questions. So that's just some of the biographical information. And then... Um, Uh, so damaged. The study of the commandments of the gospel and the life according to the commandments of the gospel. Monastic life is life according to the commandments of the gospel. People will be judged at God's judgment according to the commandments of the gospel. On the precariousness of the monastic life when it is not based on the commandments of the gospel. Who never goes by the device of the godless, who never loiters in the way of sinners, nor sits in the company of the destructive, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who reflects on his law day and night. He is like a tree that is planted beside the flowing waters that yields its fruit in due season, and whose leaves do not fall. And all that he does prospers. The Holy Spirit teaches and guides true servants of God, men who have become God's own. Attend my people to my law. Incline your ear to the words of my mouth. Psalm 77, 1. On guarding oneself from occasions of sin or temptations. Alphabetic patrology. God-pleasing life and human society must precede God-pleasing life in silence and solitude. On guarding oneself from good that is proper to fallen human nature. Concerning the enmity and conflict between fallen nature and the commandments of the gospel. On reading the gospel and the writings of the fathers. On the solitary life. Let it not be hidden from beloved brethren that the highest kinds of monastic life, that is to say, solitude in a remote desert or silence and reclusion, as also living with a spirit-bearing elder in unconditional obedience to him, were not established by chance or by the will of the intelligence of men, but by the special province, design, vocation, and revelation of God. Anthony the Great, the head of monasticism, the founder of the hermit life, did not retire into the desert until he had been clothed with power from on high, and then only because he was called by God. Although this is not stated clearly in his biography, yet subsequent events in his life of the saint prove it conclusively, that he was guided by the divine voice and commanded to go into a remote inner desert, for the strictest silence is actually stated in his life. To St. Marcarius the Great, a contemporary of St. Anthony, though slightly younger, an angel appeared and showed him a wild and barren plain, which later became the famous Egyptian Skeet, and told him to settle there, promising that the arid plain would be peopled with a multitude of anchorites. Life of St. Anthony, Great Menology, Vitae Patrium, Patrologae, Cursus Compilation, Alphabetical Patrology...
The devil immediately van vanished, filling the cell with a vile stench. The coming of Christ to a person is always linked with joy, free from fear. Then all human thoughts vanish. Then the mind is fixed on the object of its vision. But on seeing what has appeared to me, I am filled with disturbance and fear. This is not Christ, but Satan. After this reflection, the saint boldly said to the apparition, Devil, leave me. Cursed are you in your visions and the cunning of your evil designs. The devil immediately vanished, filling the cell with a vile stench. It is impossible for a person who is still in the realm of carnal sophist sophistry and who has not received the spiritual realization of human fallen human nature to give some value to his actions and not to consider himself of some worth. However humbly he may speak and however humbly he may appear outwardly, true humility is incompatible with carnal sophistry. Sophistry impossible for... It, humility, is property of spiritual understanding, says St. Mark the ascetic. Those who have not come consider themselves debtors to every commandment of Christ, honor the law of God in a bodily manner, without understanding either what it says or what it is based. Therefore, they think it can be fulfilled with actions. See the lives of Anthony the Great. Onuphorus the Great and other hermits and solitaries. Concerning life and obedience to an elder. Concerning counselors and counseling and concerning life under spiritual direction. The aim of the monastic life consists in studying the will of God and making it one's own and obeying it. Love for our neighbor is a means of attaining love for God. On preparation for prayer. On attention at prayer. On the cell rule. Concerning bowels. With the Jesus prayer, make some 20 prostrations and 20 bowels from the waist. Others make 30 prostrations and 30 bowels. Others 40 prostrations and 40 bowels and so on. It is useful to add some prostrations and bowels in prayer to the Mother of God. Most Holy Lady, Mother of God, save me a sinner. <clears throat> On the practice of the Jesus prayer. On unceasing prayer. On divine meditation. On remembrance of death. On the narrow way, the narrow way is designed by God himself. The teaching of the Holy Fathers concerning the narrow way. Troubles are the special lot of the monks in the last time. Sources of monastic temptation. On the necessity for courage in temptations. On sobriety and vigilance. On the use and harm of bodily discipline. St. Isaac the Syrian says that laxity or relaxation, that is to say, neglect of fasting, vigil, silence, and other bodily disciplines and aids to the spiritual life, allowing oneself constant ease and enjoyment, harms even elders of the proficient or perfect. Concerning animal and spiritual zeal. Concerning almsgiving. Concerning poverty or detachment. Concerning human glory. Concerning the resentment or remembrance of wrongs. The meaning of the term world. Avoiding acquaintance with the opposite sex.
Concerning Fallen Angels. The first way of struggling with the fallen angels. On the close affinity between virtues and vices. On keeping the eye of the soul from all that is harmful to it. Concerning repentance and mourning. Here are some little snippets in the back here which I like. Let's see here. In the cells you should be occupied in spiritual reading and such hard work as does not excite attachment to it. Otherwise all your attention will be drawn to handwork of which you are attached. God and your salvation will become distant for you. Worldly books and still more, those that are harmful for morality should on no account be read or even kept in your cell. So interesting that that was such a temptation then as opposed to like television, right? Or internet even. Um, so yeah, here is this uh, wonderful book here. Um, the Arena. An Offering of contemp Contemporary Monasticism. And um, again, it is published. This is the publisher at Holy Trinity Monastery. And it is by Bishop Ignatius Brian Chaninov, uh, 1807 through 1867. Uh, this is Justin William Savoy, and I hope that you like this quick look at the arena. Um, yeah, so there's a lot to be gained there, and I think I'm going to definitely add it to my spiritual reading list to revisit. I saw some helpful things as I was skimming through it with you. And um, yeah, I'm going to resume um, the rest of my afternoon. I've been watching some documentaries about an old believer, Russian iconographer... And um, a little bit about Merton, some different talks and whatnot on Merton, um, some discussions about some different Buddhist figures, and um, also, I guess, some, some studies on jazz and the beat poets. Can't really go too wrong there, I don't think. Um, just some things that are interesting. It kind of ties into, like, the Seven Story Mountain and whatnot. Um, yeah, just that's how I spend a lot of my spare time. I don't have a lot of other hobbies other than academic or book or the interior life. And then, of course, being out in nature and then time with my children. And my children were here with me for several days. They've left and they will return um, very quickly here and we'll spend the holiday um, together. And so I'm just taking some quiet, peaceful time and um, I feel like compelled to move forward um, in spiritual life, which is always really nice to be in that place. And I thank God for everything um, that has been provided for me during these hard and difficult times. Um, and I hope that you all are doing okay during these times as well. It's been kind of strange here in Oregon, if any of you follow the news. Uh, I'm not going to get onto that tangent. I just wish you all well, and I look forward to continuing to provide you with content as always, you can reach me, SavoyJustin123 at gmail.com. That's a good way to figure out ways to support the channel. Um, yes, so I will be talking to you all soon. Thank you. Goodbye.